Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Joining us now is retired Air Commodore Abayomi Balogun. He's a war veteran who was commissioned into the Nigerian Air Force in 1982 and he fought in the Liberian Civil War and also in Sierra Leone. He's the author of Nigerian Air War in Sierra Leone. And he'll be taking us down memory lane with lessons learned in the victory that was secured in Sierra Leone and how this can be applied to win the current war against insecurity in the Northeast. Welcome to the morning show, Commodore. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be here. Good morning. We're glad so, to have you on the morning show. Well, we've been having um, a special focus on the issue of insecurity uh, in the Northeastern part of the country and elsewhere uh, in, in the country. What exactly do you think is wrong? Uh, we seem not to be able uh, to make a difference. The Nigerian government, as far back as December 2015, had said that Boko Haram had been technically defeated and that Boko Haram had been degraded. The president, even as at yesterday, was assuring Nigerians that uh, he will not give up until the battle is won. Where do you think the problem lies? Is it team synergy or is it as the inspector general of police was saying yesterday, lack of funding, lack of personnel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the insurgency <coughs> in the Northeast <laughs> is a complex situation, uh, which is difficult to handle from the military point of view. However, I think uh, if we did not forget <coughs> yesterday, we could have handled the insurgency more effectively than what we were doing now. Uh, why did I say if we did not forget yesterday? Because uh, we have fought this kind of wars in the past. Surprisingly, in Liberia and Sierra Leone, yeah, they were not terrorists, but they were insurgents who wanted to take over power by all means. And that's what we have in the Northeast. Now, if we had remembered we will remember the tactics that we adopted in those days in faraway Liberia and Sierra Leone. To me, we should have adopted the same tactics or even go higher. But what I've seen so far is that uh, we seem not to be ready to sit down, think well, and plan well. Now, at the beginning of the war on insurgency, I would like to ask Nigerians, did we first accept that we were at war? I'm not sure. Because if we had accepted that we were at war, there were so many things that needed to be done before you declare a state of emergency and you say you are going to war. First thing, you must first know your enemy. Did we know the enemy adequately enough to have engaged them? Did we check their capabilities and limitations to know which way to go? In my opinion, we did not do enough. So I will want to say if this war is going to end, we must go back, go back to the table and answer all these questions. Then once we are able to answer the questions, we will know uh, the next line of action to do. Uh, you also asked if uh, it was due to uh, equipment, or synergy, or manpower. Those are the three major things that is required before you go to war. You must have known your enemy, you know what he has, and you must have more than him. It does not, you, you don't go to war and you expect your opponent to overwhelm you. Rather, you better stay at home. So when you know their strength, you know what is required to also counter them. Numerically, you must be minimum of times three of their strength. So did we study? Did we know their strength? I'm not sure. Now, synergy between the services. And uh, that's still why I said we, did, we forgot yesterday. Because synergy between the services, even the government agencies. Because if you say the services have uh, synergized, and the government agencies that are supposed to support the services are not there, they are not in line, they don't know what the military is doing, then you still will have difficulty. Because the military, yes, they are the end user, they go to war with weapons. However, 
the other supporting elements, the equipment must come through the civil channel. So if the government agency really don't understand to, so, uh, they will cause a, a backlog. So everybody must work together. Everybody must synergize. It does not start and end with the members of the armed forces alone. And then you now said uh, uh, the president had said that we had degraded Boko Haram. Uh, they are now running away. Yes, sometimes it is good for morale. And that's why I, uh, I employ military men, people still serving, to work more with the media houses for strategic communication. Because you must target your audience and you must have messages for everybody. Yes, we can come up and say we have degraded them. It could be a psychological warfare. It could be a communication warfare. Whichever thing you can do to win a war, you must do. So uh, I would not know why the president says so, or why the hierarchy of the military says so, but it must have been for a purpose. Uh, we have not finished the war. The war is ongoing. But I believe with more synergy and better thinking and uh, strategic planning, we can still do well. Questions there demanding answers. But let's look at intelligence and technology. Um, how are we faring in that aspect? And how much of an impact do you think that, you know, could have? Uh, intelligence and uh, security, uh, intelligence gathering. That is where it starts from. You don't go anywhere without intelligence on your opponent. Uh, you must know everything about him. And that is true intelligence. Intelligence comes from various ways. We are human intelligence, artificial intelligence, different kind of intelligence. It depends on which one you choose to, to adopt. Or it can be a com combination of all. So the Israelis, for example, they believe more on human intelligence, where the Americans believe more on uh, technological intelligence. But it all must work together to be able to give you early warning and lead to enable you to prosecute whatever you are doing. Even within civil organization, there is intelligence gathering. So now we have better than what we did in Liberia and Sierra Leone. In Liberia and Sierra Leone, we didn't have much technology to gather intelligence. But here in Nigeria now, we have moved higher. The equipment we have now can, if properly coordinated and utilized, can give you all you need about your opponents. So you've talked about how the war against insurgency was mismanaged from the outset. You've talked about intelligence shortfalls. Let's look at the question of leadership, which you raised in your book. What is your view on the leadership of the military today and how it has contributed, if at all it has, to a decline in our military prowess? Yes, the leadership of the military, uh, for now, I think uh, whatever challenges they are having was inherited. In my opinion, the real Boko Haram became so troublesome between 2013 and 2014. And that was when we would have won it, but that was when we lost it. Now, the current, <clears throat> the current leadership of the military Yes, the president appoints them. And I will expect the president and Nigerians to look at the performance and say, since you've taken over, what are your achievements? What are your deficiencies? And then I should think that the National Assembly will also assess and recommend to the president, should they continue? Should they stop? Yes, a lot of uh, rumors have been going around. People are saying the president was going to change them. But the president must have his own reasons. There are so many things about the country's security, uh, security architecture, that he sees that most of us don't see. Yes, we hear about Boko Haram, we hear about banditry, kidnappers, everything. But I think the president is briefed daily on the implications of all these challenges. And uh, he will have, yes, assess everybody available to see who can deliver, because you don't want to live anywhere in a vacuum. If it does not have a better replacement for them, it's better to keep rather than 
to let the head be empty. I just want to take you back. What ought to have happened in 2013 and 2014? Because you just mentioned now that an opportunity was missed then to have won the war against Boko Haram. Yes, this is my opinion, my personal opinion, because I was in the service then and I was part of it. I was not at the top of the ladder, but I was in the middle. And why I said a lot of opportunities came our way in 2013 and 2014. Immediately after Chibo girls, uh, the, direct, uh, the abduction of the Chibo girls, we seek assistance from some foreign countries, which today you hear that those countries came, but they never assisted Nigeria. And I said, that's erroneous. Because uh, I was part of it, and I know it's not good to lie. I I'm aware that they assisted a lot. But we were asking for what was not in the MOU from them. What was in the MOU was provide intelligence that will lead us. First objective was to recover the Chibok girls. The second was later to provide us intelligence in the war against insurgency. And in my opinion, they did give us. Now, the problem is when they gave us such intelligence, what did we do with it? I was representing the Air Force on that team. And I go there and I come back and I said, this is what we have. It's left to us to execute. Now, did we execute well? Sometimes we don't even do it at all. That's why I say we had the opportunity. What we lacked then was intelligence. And they provided. So what was left was execution. So that's why I still go back. I say we forget yesterday. Because uh, when we did not have such things, we fought in Liberia, we fought in Sierra Leone. Now we have it to our advantage. Why did we not use them well? Thank you. Well, Commodore, let me ask you this. What's your assessment of the uh, reported relationship between Boko Haram and other insurgents in Nigeria and some foreign interests like the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, Akim, uh, that's the Islamic Maghreb, and uh, Libyan stockpiles? Could that be what is responsible uh, for the resilience of Boko Haram, rather than many of these shortcomings uh, that you have identified? Uh, I will not succumb to that fact that uh, because they are now fractionalized, that's why we are having a problem. To me, we have not uh, held the bull by the horns. And that's why we are having difficulties on several fronts. We've had Boko Haram before now. When they were Metasine in Kano, we crushed them. Yes, not totally. Some of them escaped. When they came to Yola, Metasine in Yola, we moved and chased them out of that place. We have done that in the past. But these days, we... We allow sentiments too much into whatever we are doing. Oh, they are these people, they are that people, don't touch them, you have to give them all sorts of things. To me, we military men don't, we really don't have time thinking about it. We consider everybody as one. So if one finger is going to make you to sin, cut it off. But in the civil society, you can't do that. Somebody will remind you that that guy. Is from the same place like your grandfather. Uh, you used to have uh, cartoons together. You can't do what. But in the interest of peace, you can sacrifice some people for the majority. If I can take you back, sir, uh, people will criticize General Basunjo for doing what he did in Kalakuta Republic, <coughs> for doing what he did in uh, Odi and uh, and the other place. But after such actions, have we seen any of such?
Kalakuta Republic was a republic within a republic, and he decided it is not possible. Fela Kuti was from Ogun <coughs> State, like Baba Basojo. But he took it and said, let's get it out. And we did. And we've had no problem ever since. But in today's Nigeria, we don't want to take the bulls by the horn. We want to even pamper them. Sorry, please go and sit down. To me, that's not the way to go. So forget the fact that we have different <laughs> factions of, uh, of uh, terrorists in Nigeria. I think we have all it takes to run them over and send them out of Nigeria. The military can still do it. We've done it in the past. Mm. Thank you. Well, many are quick to say that, you know, funding is the challenge in fighting or tackling insecurity. I don't seem to hear you put that as a priority in your list. Instead, you're talking about intelligence and leadership. However, but let, me, let me stay with funding. Um, when you look at successive budgets in Nigeria in recent times, uh, security takes a large chunk of, uh, of monies. Do you think that what we spend is commiserate with the outcomes we are getting so far? Uh, that's why I said in the beginning, were we ready for the war? Did we declare a war? If you declare a war, you know that the war takes priority over everything. Whatever you are doing, if your country is not peaceful, you cannot do it. There is no development, there is no progress. Once there is no peace, so it takes priority. What is our allocation to defense spending now? Even now, for us to tackle this insurgency, in my opinion, as a former Air Force combat crew pilot, the Air Force does not require less than about 100 helicopters. Do we have the funding to buy that? No. How many helicopters do we have we now? We get it because we do. I can't tell you exactly because I've left the service for about four years. And as at then? So I don't have the, 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 the figure. Yes, at that then we had what we needed. As at then, we don't have several fronts like we have now. Now you have fronts everywhere, all over the country. How do you do it? You want to be in Meduguri in the northeast? You want to be in the northwest? You want to be in the north central? You want to be in the southeast? You want to be in the middle belt? With what resources? So if we agree, now kidnapping along Kaduna Abuja Road, you don't have helicopters to patrol that road. You need a mobile compact team that will be able to enter anywhere within that road and make arrests or get the people out of the way. But we are putting policemen who are static and only patrol the roads. Kaduna Abuja, what of the interland? What of off-road? Who does that? It's either you use helicopters or you use drones. That will give you a wider view and gives you early warning. So funding can never be enough when you are talking of uh, war. When you are ready for war, you must fund it. If not, it will drag forever. So I, in my own opinion, the, the funding is still not there. And the equipment are inadequate. But yes, even if you don't have enough, with better thinking and better planning, you could use what you have to get what you want. What's your assessment of morale within the armed forces regarding welfare of our armed forces and also the important issue of post-traumatic stress disorder, which you raise in your book? Yes, ma. thank you very much. That's a, a part of the book that uh, I would like the whole world to know because uh, it does not happen in Nigeria. I asked somebody a question yesterday. I said, take the three services, Army, Navy, Air Force. Who is more, which of the services seemingly more brutal to civilians than the rest? And uh, when I collated the statistics, everybody said, uh, okay, majority said is the army. Now, I want to give you a small background to the Nigerian army because uh, before people transformed to be something, something <coughs> must have led to it. Uh, the, simple, we left, we sent them to the world wars. We've been sending them everywhere before the creation of Navy or Air Force. And when these guys come back from those wars, they came back with a shitload of emotional and psychological 
disorders, which Nigerians at that time, we took for granted, we didn't know what it was, and we allowed them to return to the barracks. One of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress is provocation, overreaction to provocation. So they came back, and when you annoy them small, uh, they will slap you 10 times. And then gradually they move within, outside the barrack and move to the civil society. That's why civilians were bearing the brunt of army brutality. But they did not just become, it was as a result of their experience in wars, which manifests in post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of things happen to soldiers when they return home from combat. Because the guy you sent to war, when he comes back, he's not the same. He's a different person. But the wife will not know the man has changed. The children will not know he has changed. And they want to relate to him the way he was before he went to war. No, it's, it does not work. Even the man does not know he has changed. And he expects life to move on. And we, the society, we don't reckon that the man has changed. There is effect of war on the family, that is the wife and the children. There is effect of war on the society. Because when these guys move out of the barracks and go into the society, they can become <coughs> violent, they will become aggressive, and they can do whatever you don't even think of. And that is, those are the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So we are trying to use this book with uh, Green Heroes Foundation to create awareness and advocacy that these people you see misbehaving, sometimes they need help. That's the essence of uh, touching on the PTSD in the book. Commodore, many Nigerians are disturbed that uh, you know, the Nigerian military appears to be overstretched and is gradually more or less uh, been uh, taken away from its uh, mandate. During the uh, last general elections, there were persons who said, look, the military should not have played a frontline role in managing the elections. And there are persons who say, look, the military, they're just everywhere. They are doing police work. Uh, what's your reaction to this? Do you feel that maybe the uh, military should pull back a bit from internal security and that the po police should be uh, upgraded and empowered to be able to fulfill their mandate? Yeah, thank you very much. This is a very uh, sensitive question because uh, who brought the soldiers out of the barracks? They are known to be in the barracks. It is we, the civilians. Why? Because of the inadequacies of the police. If we had equipped the police well enough, we had given them the required equipment and the reorientation to combat crimes within the society the army will not be outside. They will be in the barracks. They are there to protect us from external aggressors. The police is here to provide protection for you and me in the towns and cities. But today, we are the same people who will see uh, thieves and say, please bring the army. The police cannot do it. So why don't you empower your police to be able to do the job, rather than bringing the army to come and do the job. The army has no role to play, except in emergency <coughs> situation in the towns and cities. They are duties of the police. So if you don't want the policemen to be involved, the military men to be involved in policing Nigeria against Nigerians, let us empower the police. The police currently is about <coughs> 371,000 in strength. How do you spread that across Nigeria? After taking those that are doing uh, bodyguards and VIP protection to big men, what number of policemen is remaining to do the job of policing Nigeria? So that's where I think we should start from. Get more policemen. Get more equipment for them and let them do the job. You don't have to have army guys on the road doing what? We are not trained to do that. It is not the job of the military to mount roadblocks or to do <coughs> checkpoints. In fact, once you put army on the road, the military on the road, you are going to corrupt them. They are not trained to do such a job. 
But now we are taking them with the police to do whatever they needed to do to keep peace. So, sir, I feel if we have enough policemen well equipped to do the job, it's not that the military is interested in doing bodyguard job anywhere. The military men will go back to the barracks and face what they are supposed to be doing. Now we have serious crisis in the northeast. How many soldiers can you take there? Because you are fighting in the northeast, you are fighting in the northwest. You have soldiers in the middle belt. What is the population of the members of the armed forces that you think they can be everywhere? It is not possible. It's no, it's no magic. You can only use what you have. So if you say the army is overstretched, I agree with you, they are overstretched, and that is why a lot of them <coughs> stay there longer than necessary. And we don't know the effect of overstaying in a war zone. If you overstay in a war zone, you become part of the problem. But if the military does not have enough resources to bring these guys back and take them, I mean, replace them, what do they do? Everybody is constrained. It is what you have that you can use. So we we'll go back to the police, empower the policemen, recruit more, free the soldiers from town duties, and let them have enough manpower to face our serious challenges elsewhere. So I believe it is not the fault of the military to just enter the town. It is we that are always requesting for them. So it is we that we have to re energize the Nigerian police force to do the job and return the soldiers to the barracks. Thank you. Well, we know that the war against insurgency can be very slow, grinding, and frustrating. But it is disturbing to know from the things you have said this morning that, you know, tactics and strategies haven't really changed since the last war campaigns. Um, what are some of the scenarios you fear could play out if we do not correct these errors immediately? Uh, yes, we can fight this war forever if we are not, uh, if we don't go back to think seriously about the insurgency we always be there. What determines whether you win or lose is your strategy and the tactics adopted. Now, the tactics, you cannot have a, a book of tactics and say, yes, you must follow it like this, like a checklist. Okay, you will go this way, you go that way. No. Terrorists and insurgents don't have manuals. But they think. And their thought is, how do they disrupt your lifestyle? They want to break you. They want to demoralize you. That's all their aim. So they are looking at soft targets here and there, and then strike and go back home. Like what I saw happen in Sierra Leone, which I think is happening here, is that in Sierra Leone, when we are scrambled to go for any of these operations and we get there, we will see... Every attack village, once the attack has taken place, you see women, youths, and children being used to ferry whatever the rebels have looted from the villages. They just go there, attack, loot, use the women, use the youths and the children to carry these things back to their camp. Now, they take them to their camp. Some will be let go. Some will be recruited. So wherever they attack, after looting, they go back. Now we hear here that uh, they have attacked so-so place. And then two days later, army moves in to repel them. And we will repel them without casualty. To me, it's the same scenario, only that we did not look at it deeply. That those guys come in, they attack, they loot, kidnap people to carry these items back to their camps. But if we had proper intelligence uh, life cycle, you know what, there's an event. What happened? You follow that life cycle. They have attacked. Now what happens? They are going somewhere. If you have an idea of where they are going, you follow them. And then you will get them. Next time, you may be lucky to get them, 
before they even commit the havoc. But you must first understand what they are doing. If they come and say, and everybody runs away, they steal, they loot, and go back, then you have to re-strategize because they are thinking they are also planning. So you have different tactics for different scenarios. It is when you get to the battlefield that uh, whatever is playing out is what you want to counter. So, uh, so far, I think, I would not say we are doing too well, but then the effort is there. But if we do more of encouraging the soldiers, making sure that all their needs, all their requirements are met, raising their morale, I tell you, they can make up for any lack of equipment because a well-motivated soldier can give his life for you as a battle commander. But if they are not well-motivated, they are not well-fed, they don't have adequate equipment, like life jacket. Ordinary life jacket, when a soldier wears it, his belief is that even he's going to die, not with the first shot, because he's protected from the chest and he's wearing a helmet. He can at least get first aid before he gets to the next hospital. But you send a soldier without a flag jacket to the war front and he's facing somebody that has a better equipment. You will run away. You can't remain there. Nobody is paid to go and die. It is just their job. And then how do you tell them, well done? For example, you, you, you send your flying eagles to go and play Brazil. And you say, when you get there, please play well. Because if you win and come back, I'm going to give you a duplex. That man is going to break his leg there. <laughs> and you tell him, uh, one goal is $100,000. They will score how many goals for you to collect that $100,000. What have we said to the military men to encourage them to go and give their lives? What have we promised them? Nothing. And they come back with PTSD. They are treated for a while, and they are left for life to rot in on their own. I know so many people that have bullet wounds on their body, and they are everywhere in Nigeria. If you don't treat, treat them, if you don't take care of them, and you don't use them, they will be used by somebody else. Thank you. So the welfare of the armed forces is key. But when you talk about strategy and following things to the logical conclusion, you assume a sincerity of purpose. However, since the beginning of this war against insurgency, allegations have been made that members of the military brass are in collusion with the terrorists. What is your comment on this? They are in collusion with the pirates? Yes, with the, with the terrorists, with the insurgents. Uh, okay, with the insurgents? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, can't, I can't confirm that. I think uh, this is another opinion of mine. Why the delay in the fight against insurgency, it is not trade. It is not commercial. It is not money. Yes, those can be byproducts of what is happening. But I think the major problem, yes, of course, is competency. Competency, in my opinion, is a major problem. Because in Nigeria today, you don't engage anybody based on competency. We engage people to do any job based on sentiments. Okay, you can do it, but where is it from? Who is it? Does it belong to our party? Especially politicians have messed up the military. Yes, I, I say it because uh, I have a lot of friends who are politicians. And some people will lobby them, uh, go and put me in this appointment, make sure I become this. And they will follow the guy because of what they are thinking to get from him tomorrow. And they lobby for him without thinking. The, if we put you in this office, it's not there for you. It's there for Nigeria. Can he do the job to satisfy the country? That's what we should look for first. So it is when incompetency started playing up in the military, that other things kept following. Because you can't win the war, 
you must keep sustaining the troops. You must keep buying uniform for them. You must keep providing food. And some people will now taste it and say, oh, this is sweet. Let's continue this way so that it does not stop. But if we had taken somebody who is competent enough, who had used the resources as should be used, and deployed the manpower and equipment the way they should be deployed, without sentiment, yes, we will win it. So I'm saying that <coughs> the problem did not start because they turned it to a business, but business out of the war is a byproduct of the war. Commodore, Commodore, briefly, let's take a look at the international dimension to this crisis that we face. Only yesterday, the uh, president of the 73rd uh, UN General Assembly was with uh, President Buhari with promises, with uh, assurances about the United Nations commitment to ensuring peace, stability, and humanitarian stability in the Lake Chad uh, region. And then we've had also uh, a lot of countries, including the United Kingdom, offering help. Uh, what's your assessment of the intervention of the international community? Do you think the international community is doing enough? And do you think there is enough synergy? I use that, your, uh, that phrase again between Nigeria and the neighboring countries uh, within ECOWAS? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very loaded <coughs> question. Yes, the international community is a game of diplomacy. Yes, everybody must look good. Even when a diploma is going to tell you he does not like what you are saying, he will not tell you openly and say, you are stupid, I don't like what you are doing. If we say we view it uh, differently. So you can hear different kind of tunes from the international community. But coming from the uh, UN General Assembly, I, I think we, we, we even deserve more from them. Because what Nigeria has done as part of our contribution to world peace and stability before we started having our own issue was great. We were one of the highest contributor or donor of troops to the United Nations. We have supported the UN in all its operations everywhere in the world. In fact, we have done over 40 UN peacekeeping missions. But most people don't know our contribution to these missions because we don't talk about it, we don't publicize it, we just go, we use our equipment, we lose our men, and we come back and we are back. So I think the UN taking that step to protect one of its as much as they can, I think it's a welcome idea. Now, between British, America, it depends on how we receive them. Yes, if, if you show them that whatever you bring, we are going to work with it. They will give you. It now depends on you. Because at the point I was director of training in the Air Force. And I know my personal relationship with the DAs and not so much. So many things we were getting. But you must create that uh, lateral rapport. It's not everything you achieve at the top. That's why the defense advisors are in Nigeria for us to relate. So it is Nigerians that we say, this is what you want. Can you do this for us? And they will tell you they can or they cannot. And when they do, they expect you to use them very well. And that's why most times they will have an MOU to guide both parties and say, this is what we will give you. We will not be able to give you this. Because every nation has their own interest first before any other person's interest. So we must have a team of people who understand our wants and how to go about it. And when they are given to us, how do we use those things judiciously? Now, in West Africa, do we have uh, enough synergy between the <coughs> West African countries? OK. In the fight against insurgency, the people you can really call People we should have synergy with are Cameroon, Chad, Niger. Maybe a little bit to uh, Benin Republic. Yes, we should have synergy 
we should work together like we did in ECOWAS where all ECOWAS uh, member states contributed troops. Now, when we went to ECOWAS, who was the major funding of ECOWAS? Nigeria. Nigeria. Now you want? Yes, we did. Now you want synergy between you and Chad and Niger and Cameroon. Who is going to fund? They cannot fund them. They can't fund themselves to protect you. So if you want to bribe somebody to come and die for you or to come and help you fight, you must provide what he needs. Have we provided? If you don't, what you will get is lip service. But if I want you to fight, I say, take this AK-47, my friend. Uh, I'll pep you up a bit. Come and do this for me. He will come and do it. So we must first go there to be able to win their loyalty and readiness to help with their lives. So the synergy between we and them, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's robust enough. If not, Lake Charge shouldn't have been a base to our insurgents because Lake Chad is Cameroon, Chad, uh, Niger, and Nigeria. And what's the site? Four of us on different borders, and some rascals will be occupying the lake, and they become a safe haven. Nobody can go in there. I still believe we are not strategizing enough. We are not taking the issue as if we are at war. We are baby, baby padding the whole thing. So we should take more drastic actions, and I believe we can get there. Well, thank you very much. Air Commodore Abayomi Balogun retired. Uh, we've really enjoyed the conversation with you very much, and I hope that the relevant authorities and stakeholders are also uh, listening to you. Thank you.